Welcome to another virtual Live Talks Los Angeles event. We welcome Malcolm Gladwell back to our series. Uh, Malcolm is a journalist, a speaker, and the author of six New York Times bestsellers, among them The Tipping Point, Blink, Outliers, What the Dog Saw, David and Goliath, and Talking to Strangers, the last two of which he appeared on our stage, and those videos are available in our YouTube channel. He's been a staff writer for The New Yorker since 1996. Uh, Foreign Policy has three times named him one of their top global thinkers, and he has uh, been named one of Time's 100 Most Influential People. He is co-founder and president of Pushkin Industries, which produces the podcast Revisionist History. Um, in this episode, we're going to talk about Revisionist History and its new season. We're going to talk about books and authors, and uh, Malcolm has a recommended reading, which is part of our inaugural uh, Live Talks Los Angeles Book Club. So welcome back, Malcolm. It's great to have you back on our stage. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Um, so my first question, Malcolm, is uh, revisionist history. Uh, this is the fifth uh, season of it, um, and you guys do several other podcasts. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a very different medium for storytelling. Tell me what you like about it. You seem very drawn and excited about it, uh, you know, following you on social media and, and these various other uh, podcasts you guys have created. Tell me, how is that different than what you normally do? Uh, well, it's, I mean, in so, diff so many different ways, it's, a different kind of creative enterprise in that it's uh, a group project, whereas writing is much more solitary. Um, and, you know, the difference between a, a podcast, the difference between a first draft and a final version of a podcast is much greater than the difference between a first draft and a final version of a book. There's just so much more involvement and value added and feedback and built into the process. Um, and the difference between storytelling in with using your voice and storytelling using words is huge. Um, it's, you know, as I've said this many times, it's so much easier to be emotional and to tap into emotions um, with your voice than it is on the page. It's harder to be analytical with your voice. If you want to tell a story that has lots of numbers, don't do it in a podcast. Um, you want to tell a story that has lots of feelings, do it in a podcast. And I was in sort of a stage in my career where um, I was attracted to the idea of telling more emotional stories. Speaking of formats and storytelling, your uh, most recent book, the audiobook version, did something very different. Um, I'm, I'm curious where the idea for, for that type of an audiobook came from. And uh, I recall when we had you on our stage talking about it, but that's been a while now. What has been the, been the audience reaction to an audiobook in that form? Well, the, the difference was that I did the audiobook for Talking to Strangers like a podcast. So right from the beginning, you know, with a podcast, when you interview somebody, you don't repeat their words. You have them speak, you know, speak for themselves. And so, and you have scoring and you have all these kinds of things. So we did, in Talking to Strangers, when you listen to that book, if I'm talking about Neville Chamberlain, you'll hear Neville Chamberlain. If I'm talking about Amanda Knox, you'll hear Amanda Knox. If you're talking about some CIA guy telling a story from long ago, you hear him in his own words, tell his part of the story. Um, and I, I, I wanted to do it that way because it struck me that audiobooks were such a wasted opportunity. You know, if you're gonna, all my previous audiobooks, I just, like everyone else, I just read them into a microphone. Why would you do that? That seems crazy use the tape that you used when you were interviewing them and bring the story to life. Um, so the, I wanted from the very beginning of doing Talking to Strangers, I had that idea in mind and the audience reaction has been extraordinary. In fact, I could be wrong, but I think this is the first major book release where the audio book has vastly outsold the physical book. Wow. Um, yeah. This, I don't think it's ever happened before. Um, well outsold. I mean, it's not even close. Uh, and so that's a, that's something I would not have anticipated happening. But um, if you combine, you know, a little self-serving note here, the New York Times bestseller list is just print. It doesn't factor in audiobooks. If they, the New York Times did what they should do and combine print and audio, I would have been, to this day, I'd still be in the top 10 of the New York Times bestseller list. But they don't do that for reasons that remain obscure to me, they decide, have decided that print book ought to be ranked differently than an 
audio version of it. And then they do a combined ebook version of that list. So maybe down yeah. the road they might throw. Well, no, one, no one buys ebooks anymore. Like it's, the whole thing is crazy. I don't know. It's like they conceived of that of that uh, of that list in two thousand and four. Um, so safe to say, your next book, you'll probably do an audiobook in the same format. I might only I might only do an audiobook. Um, in fact, I'm working on an audiobook right now. Um, which will only be released in audio form. You will not have a, in fact, I'm working on two. Um, you can't buy it at a bookstore. You can only get it, um, uh, uh, you can only get it through your ears. Uh, that's, I just think this is an, an underexplored area of storytelling. Uh, fascinating. Well, we look forward to that. How, how far away might that be? Mm, end of the year, beginning of next year. Wow, okay. Um, so, um, Let's dive into revisionist history. Um, I, in the description of the podcast, you, it says it's the overlooked and the misunderstood is a big part of, of, of what the podcast is all about. I'm curious, how do these themes and ideas come to you? I wish I knew, because then I could like, improve the process. Um, I think what happens is in December of every year, I start rooting around for ideas. I grow increasingly desperate. Uh, desperation turns to panic, panic turns to despair, and then I've managed to luck out five seasons in a row. <laughs> but I don't know where they come from. I mean, anywhere, you know, generally there are, you know, there's, there's usually a theme. This year the theme is our attachments. So many of the shows are about the attachments we have to ideas, objects, rituals and what's wrong with those attachments, how those attachments lead us astray. So I, I generally, there's an idea percolating in my head and I explore it. And sometimes you just, by chance, you know, you, someone tells you some random story and you think that would be a great episode of Revisions History. Uh, but there's no, the process is entirely serendipitous and I wish it wasn't. So Malcolm, the, the pandemic is forcing a lot of companies, a lot of institutions to actually, you know, sort of look inward and revisit how it is they do things. I mean, publishing is, 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 would be part of this. I mean, there's been a tradition of, you know, people doing things the way they've always done them and there's never been a good enough reason to change. And I think this, is, this time is forcing us to do that. One particular industry or institution I want you to comment on about sort of in a post-pandemic world or maybe what questions it should be asking itself about how it operates um, is higher education. You've written about, you've said a lot about higher education over the years. Any comments on, on what do you think is happening, you know, in the halls of the boards of trustees of big institutions wondering how they get through this? Well, it's clear that um, a lot of colleges aren't going to survive this, that, um, you know, the, the, the middle tier of colleges were, particularly private colleges were already at death's door and now they're being deprived of, you know, possibly an entire year of tuition and the number of foreign students is obviously going to come way down. And so I think there's going to be a kind of bloodbath in that, in that sector. Um, and, you know, maybe that will encourage people to, to uh, pursue more sustainable models of instruction. Um, the current system where huge numbers of people attend these colleges, drop out and are left with large amounts of debt is clearly unsustainable. And so maybe this shock to the system will be a, a, um, a impetus for us to reform and re-examine what we're doing here. because. Um, it was, it, was, it was a crazy system. You know, 10 schools with $120 billion in the bank and everyone else kind of living hand to mouth. It didn't make any sense. Uh, you know, uh, the richest institutions educate the smallest number of students. That doesn't make any sense. Harvard University should have the largest enrollment of any university in the country, right? If you're the richest, you should use your resources to educate the most people. Instead, Harvard's one of the smallest schools in the country. Where 
in what universe would you dream of a system where you would have, one school would have fifty billion dollars in the bank and have an under, have a undergraduate population of eight thousand? This is that's the craziest thing I've ever heard, right? I mean, it's just like, I mean, it makes no sense. And so I don't know why we've. So maybe, like I said, maybe this is a shock to the system, a much needed shock to the system. So Malcolm, there's probably you know a lot of uh, college age kids right now debating whether you know to stay home and go to take classes online or um uh or maybe take a gap year um um what would you do if you were in that predicament let's take you back so many years if you were looking at you know about to enter harvard let's say or princeton or or a you know, tier one university and the, the proposition is it's going to be online education uh for the that first semester in the fall what would you do I, I mean, the idea of paying $70,000 a year for an online education is the most absurd thing I've ever heard. I wouldn't, I, I just take a year off. I mean, I, 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 you know, I know of parents in Manhattan who are sending their kids to private schools and the same thing, they're paying 40 grand for their seven year old to sit in front of a computer three hours a day. Like, that's just the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Um, I think you should take a break. If I was, 18 right now and facing that prospect this fall, I would, I'd take this opportunity to travel, I'd go to some far corner of the world and get a whole different kind of experience and then come back when this country has come to its senses and finally knows, you know, finally takes concrete steps to control the virus. All right, let's uh, get into uh, the podcast and the new season. But before we do that, I think it's June 2nd, you guys uh, sort of revisited, uh, you had an episode called The Limits of Power. And given mm -hmm. the, uh, the protests and, and the police issues, and you've written a lot about uh, police and power, uh, your immediate thoughts about how the public is reacting to this, how sort of the institution of policing is reacting to this and elected officials perhaps and what do you think should happen yeah well i posted a chapter from my not not my most recent book but the one before that david and goliath it was about northern ireland and the battle and the the troubles there the, the fight between the protestant majority and the catholic minority and it was all about how the police in northern ireland had lost legitimacy with the Catholic minority. And I thought it was this wonderful allegory for what's happening right now in America, where I believe the police have lost legitimacy with the African American population, among others. And legitimacy is composed of a series of, um, uh, of, uh, of three, there are sort of three prongs to it. A system is conceived of as legitimate when the law is predictable when it doesn't change arbitrarily overnight. It's seen as legitimate when the law is fair, when one group is treated the same under the law as another. And it's seen as legitimate when um, people, particularly minority groups, feel they can speak up and be heard if they have a grievance. And when you have failure on along those three lines, you have a problem. The police can no longer do their job because the population no longer believes the exercise of police authority is legitimate. That happened in Northern Ireland in the late 60s. And it took them 20 years to fix, 20 years of bloodshed. Um, that is currently, I believe, the state in many parts of this country where the police force have lost legitimacy because they have failed to uphold those three standards. And so the task of restoring legitimacy See, is necessarily a structural one. Um, we have and a subjective one. We have to. We won't. The problem won't be fixed until we can sit down with members of uh, minority groups and say, "Do you feel heard when you have a grievance? Do you feel you're treated the same as a white person, a privilege? Do you feel the law is applied predictably towards you or arbitrarily?" And when they can say yes to those three questions then we'll, we'll be fine, right? How do you get to yes? You have to work really hard and it takes many, many years. And I, you know, I, one, of, one of the worries I have is that we're getting caught up right now either in overly personalizing this, focusing too much on individual police officers 
and failing to understand that this is a systemic problem. And second, going after systemic solutions, which are only tangential to the larger project of legitimacy. You really, you, you need to do a 20 things that restore yeses to those three questions. That's what we need to be focused on, those three questions. Do you feel, um, I mean, there, there's been a movement, you know, by some advocate for this notion of defund the police. Is that accomplishing anything? I don't know what that means. So if it means that we need to reconceive of the responsibilities of police forces, then I am 100% in agreement. And as, by the way, so are most police officers, right? The, we have turned police officers into social workers. Why? Because we have decided to dismantle the institutions that care for the mentally ill, that care for the homeless, that deal with domestic disturbances. And we've just, we've just dumped those responsibilities onto the backs of police officers who are not trained as social service agents, right? They're not trained to deal with mental illness. Like, we're, we're just too uh, lazy and cheap to build the kind of effective social services necessary to deal with people struggling with those kinds of problems. And so we default the problem onto the cops. If you look at where are the majority of police shootings in this country, um, they are not in, uh, in situations where a crime is being committed. The majority of police shootings involve domestic disturbances. And many of those domestic disturbances involve someone who is, has some degree of mental illness. Um, you know, we created this problem. It, don't just, like, one thing I really object is people who point at the police and say, it's all your fault. No, no, no. It's my fault and your fault because we have sat by over the last 20 years and acquiesced to the dismantling of social institutions to deal with our most pressing social problems. As a result, the police have been left holding the burden, right? Yes, they, I, I totally agree they have not, they have not dealt with that burden as effectively and graciously as they could have. But I'm to blame as well, right? Because I let it happen. And, you know, this, there's a fantasy out there that somehow we can like, when people use that word defund, they think, oh, maybe we just need to spend less money on policing. No, 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 no. Any solution to this problem involves spending more money. It means building social service institutions that do not exist right now. So my job as a you know, em employed professional is to take out my checkbook. That's my job, right? And unless I'm willing to do that, I, sh I cannot be part of this conversation. Do you feel, um, um, I mean, I, here in Los Angeles, there's you know, a, a homeless situation that seems like it's getting worse and worse. And um, it's not a sexy subject for elected officials to, to tackle. There isn't a ribbon cutting ceremony and photographs and it's not, you know, it, it's not gonna fit within an election cycle. It's, it's far more than that. Is, um, uh, what would it take to, to, to get the people we put in office, you th in your opinion, to sort of own it more and, and invest in it more? It's funny, I do, the, the last episode of my podcast this season is about homelessness and about what do we owe the homeless? What is our obligation to them? So I spend a lot of time thinking about this issue. And um, I have this fascinating, the heart of the episode is this, I go to Jacksonville, Florida, spend time with a homeless group there and talk about their struggles to reduce the number of homelessness. You know, and it's really simple. It's that they have 650 bucks a month to spend on housing for homeless. There are no apartments renting for 650 bucks in Jacksonville. There are apartments renting for $800, but they don't have the extra 150 a month to make those work, right? Someone's got to write a check. Now, right now, the situation is the person who writes that check is probably going to be the taxpayers of Jacksonville. So someone has to stand up to the taxpayers of Jacksonville and say, I need more money for you, from you to take care of the people who are most in need in our community. You find me an example of a politician in America in the last four years who has had the courage to stand up to their electorate and say, I need you to write me a check. Right? I'm waiting. Right. <laughs> 
No, uh, hence the challenges. I mean, uh, so going into the 26th, the, the election this fall, what do you, um, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's not, as, like I said, it's not something someone runs on as a perfect banner. It's not a, you know, a great uh, statement to make. It's, it's you know, it, and, and talking about raising taxes to pay for things like these are unattractive. If, if you were to whisper something in a Joe Biden's ear, what would you say? I would say that, uh... I don't believe the line that says that you can't make that argument to Americans. I think Americans are willing to accept their moral obligations to the less fortunate if they are asked properly, right? I mean, and by asked properly, I mean, stand up and make a moral claim. This is a deeply moral country. There are a huge majority of people in this country who take their moral obligations to each other seriously and to their community seriously. It just so happens that our politicians have decided to ignore those moral foundations. Um, I don't know why, it doesn't make any sense to me. My advice to Joe Biden would be, stand up and talk about our obligations to each other and say, that's what ought to come first. And I think if the person who makes that argument and makes the argument well, is the person I think who will strike a chord with the American population. And I mean, and it, it seems that that's a very Christian argument to be making, and 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 a big part of the electorate leaning one way happens to be evangelical Christians. How would you make that argument to that evangelical Christian community? I think they would be the easiest people to reach. I mean, I would just simply quote from the scripture: "What did Jesus spend his time doing? Essentially, hanging around with the homeless of his time, right?" with the beggars and the cripples and the people with leprosy and the prostitutes and just read the scriptures. That's all he's doing. He, you know, he's not, he's not attending fundraisers, you know, at some Pharisee mansion. He's like, he's on the streets. He's a, the man is a, is a social worker on the streets of his community. You know, so I don't think it's that, you know, I honestly don't think it's that hard. I think there are, there are millions of evangelicals of all stripes in America waiting for someone to speak their language and put these claims in, in, in terms that, they, um, res that will resonate with them. All right, let's dive into a few more uh, episodes. Uh, the dragon psychology episode. Mm -hmm. Well, I decided to have a little fun with art museums and to compare their behavior to dragons. Dragons, of course, are hoarders. Dragons hoard treasure and virgins, even though they have no interest in either treasure or virgins, right? They never, they don't show them off. They don't, you know, wear their treasure out in public. They hide it under, in their lair. And that's what museums do. In most of the collections of the major museums, 95% of their collections are in storage. They're not. Um, and I thought this was a nice, interesting puzzle. So I decided to explore it. Um, and uh, that's a great, that episode is, you know, we've got, I have J.R. Tolkien reading poetry. I've got, I mean, it's just, a, it was a lot of fun. And, and uh, did any of the, any major museums talk to you and defend their uh, practices? Uh, from the volume of angry emails that I've gotten over the last <laughs> 10 days from museum curators, the answer is that uh, it did touch in Europe as it was intended to, yes. <laughs> um, then you did, you did four episodes on uh, controversial military tactics of Pacific theater during World War II. Is that, is, 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 have you done that many episodes on a single subject? Is this the first time you've done? Well, I've not as a single story. I've done episodes around a single theme four or more, but this is the first time we've done, we told a single story over four episodes. So it's a, a, a continuous narrative in four parts. Um, about the events in Japan in the spring of 1945. Um, it's an incredibly powerful and moving story that um, I originally was just going to do one episode and then go to two and then three and then four because I was so engrossed by this. Um, and weirdly, a story, it might be, I think, one of the most um, tragic and moving stories of the Second World War and one which many people do not know, which I don't, I, you know, even I didn't really understand it fully. So 
um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to seeing how people respond. It's uh, it's not a, a a mini series for the faint of heart. That's all I'll say. So, did you start out thinking it would be multiple episodes, or did it just as you started working on it, it, it became more than one episode could handle? Well, that's the great thing about this medium is you know, um, it's flexibility. You know, you start out thinking it's one episode, and then you wake up two months later and it's four, and it's fine. Um, it's not a Podcasts are, that's one of the many things that I love about them is, um, is, how, is how much freedom it gives me as a storyteller. In uh, Hamlet Was Wrong, uh, you talk about hiring practices and um, you did some research based on people who worked for you. Uh, tell us more about that episode. I had this idea. I don't remember. I have a terrible memory. So I wanted to do a quick thing on hiring, and I thought, you know, here, I, you know, I'm always in a position where I'm pre, I'm, I'm telling other people, you know, how to make, how to do things better. So I thought, you know, maybe it's time for me to examine myself. So I called up all, all my old assistants. I've had many over the years, and just asked them to tell me the story of how I hired them. And I discovered all kinds of, quite, shocking things about my hiring practices, <laughs> which I decided to share with the listeners of Revisionist History. But basically, I violate every known rule of hiring. And then at the, the end of the episode, I attempted to justify my own behavior. I'm not sure it's a success, um, the justification. I think the episode is hilarious. I think it's fun. You know, it's very, very lighthearted and tongue in cheek. But I get into the Peter principle, the idea that once you accept the idea, you know, the famous Peter principle is that people get promoted to their level of incompetence. Once you accept that fact is true, which I do, then you kind of have to give up on any kind of premeditated hiring practice. <laughs> so, so it's all about, yes, the problem with premeditated hiring practices. So much, and hiring is, is, is part of this, um, is like everyone is trying to build efficiencies with how these things are done, and there's algorithms and and, and these, these uh, spiders, whatever you call them, that go through and scan resumes and look for certain keywords. And so that how somehow filters, filters you know, the best possibilities to the top. And then at the end of the day, you know, a tiny percentage of them actually get interviewed. Um, I realize the efficiencies that everyone seems to feel they're getting, but we, we do this in a lot of things corporations do and universities do it, lots of institutions do it. What are the risks? What's happening wrong in doing and relying on those sort of systems? Well, I don't really go that far, although I will just say that um, I don't think there's anything. The, the, the mistake is that the patterns and practices you use to hire people enforce the status quo as opposed to confront it. So if you look at a law firm and you see that everyone who is a partner at the law firm is a middle-aged white guy who went to an Ivy League law school. I think it's reasonable to ask the question, why do they keep hiring the same person over and over again, right? Um, could be that maybe the only good lawyers are middle-aged white guys who went to Ivy League law schools. But then if you do like five minutes of work, you discover actually that's not true. And that, in fact, there seems to be, the research I've seen says there's very little uh, um, correlation between the so-called quality of your uh, law school and your fitness as a lawyer. And there certainly is no correlation between being a middle-aged white guy and being a good lawyer. So let's set that aside. So what are we left with then? Well, what we're left with is they're hiring in such a way that all they do is reproduce their existing um, demographic. And that's a problem with the system. So one way to do that is to formally change the system. And the other way to do that is to throw out systems altogether. And I, tongue in cheek, propose a, a world in which we throw out the systems altogether and essentially hire people at random. <laughs> which is an idea, which is an idea which I, which I, the purpose of going back and interviewing all my assistants is I essentially hired them all at random. I just like, the first person through the gate, I was like, all right, you get the job. Turns out really well, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and all of your former assistants willingly participated in the study? 
Well, I, I stopped it. I interviewed four of them. I, I ran into the room. Did I interview five? No, four. It was a, it was a lot of fun. All right, uh, Malcolm, thanks a lot. Finally, to our new book club. Uh, books entertain, inform, comfort, educate, and in this time of pandemic, everyone's looking for the next read. Uh, we're gonna talk about uh, that in a little bit, but first I wanna ask you some questions about your reading habits. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so some of your favorite authors? Oh, I read every Lee Child book. I read, I've read every John Le Carey book. I read a huge numbers of spy thrillers. I read lots of books, depending on, right now because I'm so obsessed with military history, I've been reading a ton of books on military history. Um, just read, the last book I read, America's Pursuit of Precision Bombing, 1910 to 1945 by Stephen L. McFarlane. It is a fantastic book, so. Um, and have you always loved books, Malcolm? As a child, were you a big reader? Oh yeah, yeah, no. My mom took me to the library every Wednesday and I would carry as many books out as I could, take as many books out as I could carry. And we would return the following Wednesday and that, we did that like clockwork for, I don't know how many years. Um, you, all the books you just mentioned to me were, were fiction and other than the military history one here at the end there. Um, What's the mix of what you read, fiction versus nonfiction? Probably half and half. I tend to read nonfiction for work because I really love reading nonfiction books when I have a reason to read them. Um, and I read fiction for pleasure, um, pure escapism. So my fiction is very lowbrow and my nonfiction is quite serious stuff. Um, print books or digital? Only print. And if I can, if I can get away with it, only hard copy. I hate paperbacks. And time of day that you read, is there a routine to, to when Malcolm reads? No, I mean, whenever possible, but usually in the evenings. Um, lots of people belong to book clubs. Have you ever belonged to a book club? Never. Um, no. Say that well, again? I like the idea, I just have never had a chance. Um, I don't, but I. whenever I've been asked, I always, my first inkling is to ask for a dossier on the baking skills of the people in the book club. Very wise. Before I join. Uh, if you were to create or conceive an interesting book club, uh, any thoughts on what that might be? Well, I want everyone in the book club to be smarter than me and to know something I don't know. So I'd like it to be a group of specialists. So I'd love, for example, if there were a group of military historians who read military histories and discussed them, I would love to be the one non-military historian in that group. That would work really well. Um, one more question about writing. Um, you mostly write nonfiction, and um, I think you've said you've dabbled in writing for television, correct? I mean, dabbled is a very generous word. I have uh, tried and failed. <laughs> I think it's the right way. Yeah, I did it for fun once. It didn't work out well. It was fun, though. I enjoy doing it, but I'm not. That's not my. That's not my strength. Do um, do you see yourself dabbling or trying in any other genres? I mean, if you read so much uh, 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 mysteries and thrillers, is that something well, you? Might... I'm happy with what I'm doing. I mean, I see myself writing different kinds of nonfiction books, um, but um, but no, I think this is at my advanced age. I think you know what you are, what the best use of your time is. Uh, it's good to know. <laughs> uh, all right, well now for your recommendation or recommendations. Two books, fiction and one fiction, one nonfiction. One is a book from last year by my, actually very good friend of mine, David Epstein, who I am in awe of, wrote a book last year called Range, which is one of those books we'll be reading 20 years from now. Um, it's the case against over-specialization. And it's just, Every page is like full of some fascinating story or fact. Um, and then I just read the new, one of my favorite thriller writers is David Ignatius. And he just had a book that came out like two weeks ago called uh, Paladin. And it's just, I read every single one of his thrillers. They're all fantastic. This one's fantastic. Um, I always feel like when I'm done with one of his thrillers, I felt this one, about halfway through I forget it's fiction 
and I think it's real. And uh, and I feel like I come I come away with them with a better understanding of kind of how that part of the world works. So I would recommend both those books highly. Malcolm, do you watch uh, movies or television or or uh, uh... a little bit? I do the same. I watch the same, you know, Netflix shows that everyone watches, um, and the same HBO shows that everyone watches. You know, I have that same, um, but I don't watch a lot. And with no sports, usually what I do is I watch sports, so all that's gone to zero. So, um, you know, I've uh, filled that time otherwise. This would have been the perfect time for you and LeBron to do the one mile run. Uh, He's ducking me, Ted. Did you try to revisit him? I haven't, I haven't. I'm now healthy and running and LeBron, I'm, I'm assuming is, you know, is out there training in LA somewhere. My, my challenge to him remains as it always has, one mile, place of his choosing, all money, the charity of his choice. We'll see who wins. I still think he's gonna beat me, but I'm more than happy to sacrifice myself um, to the greater cause of LeBron's, LeBron's glory. <laughs> thanks, Malcolm. It's great having you. Uh, thanks again for joining us. Malcolm's uh, most recent book is Talking to Strangers. The podcast is Revisionist History. You can purchase the books he recommended in our bookshop.org store. Thanks for taking part, Matt. Thank you so much, Ted. You bet. Take care.